Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here and to have the opportunity to uh, present a paper before major references in, in, the, in the field. So uh, the paper is part of a new project, so all uh, criticisms are welcome. And I apologize if my presentation is uh, schematic. It was uh, kind of hard to synthesize. So the paper is about, I changed the title, the paper is about uh, the social conditions of epistemic democracy. And uh, two things interest me here. First, uh, I, I argue for a broader conception of epistemic democracy, suggesting that citizens' collective ability to make good political decisions depend on social conditions uh, as much as on political ones. I try to show that a democratic regime uh, that lets important cognitive and material inequalities grow between its citizens or fails to reduce them uh, will likely also <coughs> fail to make good political decisions. And so this in turn suggests that epistemic democracy cannot sustain itself without also not nurturing a democratic, that is, inclusive and egalitarian society, and that it is arguably by doing so that it acquires a significant part of its epistemic advantages. And second, uh, I discussed the possibility for epistemic democracy to entirely free itself from prior substantive constraints bearing on its claim to legitimacy. Uh, so against a widespread view on um, constitutional or liberal democracy, I suggest that there are no reasons for conceiving constitutional rights as prior and external constraints or preconditions uh, in an epistemic conception of democracy. But I also point out that the social conditions identified in this paper might work as substantive preconditions of a different sort uh, for epistemic democracy, and I examine what it entails. So. Uh, since I don't have much time, I'll try to be brief on section one about the democratic status of rights and constitutional principles to uh, focus more on sections two and three of the paper, which discuss social preconditions of epistemic democracy. So uh, let us define epistemic democracy as the collective ability to reach good political decisions through democratic means. And by good political decisions, I mean political decisions aiming at appropriate social or political ends with appropriate means. So good political decisions may involve judgments about what is right or what is just, but they, also may, they may also aim at what is economically, socially, or strategically maybe best uh, for the political community at a given time, something like the common good or the general interest. So one of the main appeals of epistemic uh, democracy lies in its promise to reconcile formal and substantive requirements of democratic legitimacy. Formal requirements of democratic legitimacy ensue from the fact that democracy can be minimally, minimally defined by its formal or procedural features. It is inclusive, participatory, and egalitarian. And so as a result, the legitimacy of a political decision made in disregard of any of these traits is considered democratically dubious. But democratic decisions are also expected to be substantially adequate, that is, to be good political decisions in the sense previously, previously defined. And in this sense, there are also substantive requirements of democratic legitimacy, which democratic decisions have to meet. So one way of putting the general argument for epistemic democracy is to say that uh, the ideal of epistemic democracy aims for, for a full realization of democratic rule without risking turning such democratic rule into a tyranny of the majority. And this is because in the epistemic conception, democratic rule is committed to the protection and promotion of substantive matters, such as justice, rights, um, or the common good. So the point um, of the first part of the paper is to argue that uh, this conception of um, epistemic democracy allows for a renewed conception of the relation between democracy and constitutional rights uh, or principles, such as these are not so much prior liberal norms constraining democracy from the outside uh, as norms built within democracy through democratic discussion and reflection. So in the epistemic conception, uh, democ democratic rule indeed manages to comply with higher standards uh, of justice and rights, but it does so in a specifically democratic that is inclusive, participatory, egalitarian uh, way. So, uh, so far so good. Uh, the notion of epistemic democracy seems to free democratic rule uh, 
from external conditions bearing on its leg legitimacy while taking rights and justice seriously at the same time. So it allows for something like general, genuine uh, self-constraint or genuine self-rule. Of course, the epistemic conception of democracy would be nothing but a vain uh, ther theoretical toy if it did not admit that reconciling the two conflicting requirements of democratic legitimacy calls for a much more demanding <coughs> conception of democracy than other accounts. Uh, epistemic democracy presupposes two main qualities of its citizens that together account for the collective ability to reach good political decisions. First, political competence, that is, a capacity to make uh, sound political judgments grounded in the relevant political information. And second, public spiritedness, that is, a commitment to the promotion of justice uh, and of the common good. Now, citizens assembled are not per se politically competent and public spirited, and so democracy is obviously uh, not spontaneously epistemic. Epistemic theories of democracy generally acknowledge this point. Uh, they approach epistemic democracy as a normative ideal, not as a description of democracy as it is. But uh, I also argue in the paper that recent works on epistemic democracy tend to focus almost exclusively on political institutions and procedures like deliberation or majority rule as ways to improve uh, citizens' ability to make good, to make good uh, democratic choices. And so I do not intend to question the epistemic virtues uh, of these procedures and institutions, but I think that focusing on, focusing on them is to take too narrow an approach uh, to epistemic democracy's requirements. And I suggest that citizens' political competence and public spiritedness <coughs> depend not only on the design of political procedures, but on the broader social cir circumstances, and that epistemic democracy's extent and implications should be reassessed uh, accordingly. And so I lean on two examples uh, to try and make my case, education and socioeconomic equality. <coughs> so epistemic democracy requires that political competence competence be up to a certain degree more or less equally distributed among citizens. This is so because a democratic decision uh, consists in the aggregation of equally counted uh, individual decisions. So as far as voting is, co is concerned, a collective decisions, decision sorry, mechanically reflects the individual decisions uh, it draws on. So the epistemic quality of a democratic choice is the exact result of the aggregated quality, if one may say so of individu on individual choices. Now, according to what can be called the emerg emergentist view defended notably by uh, Hélène Lombard, epistemic democracy does not necessarily require that citizens enter the political process with a high level of individual political competence. Because if the deliberative process is adequately conceived, a citizen entering the political debate with incomplete knowledge, possibly biased views or unsound argument, is likely to experience a cognitive transformation in exchanging with others, which should result in her having better funded judgments uh, when time has come for her to cast her vote. Uh, but uh, good decisions won't emerge from political de deliberation if participants are vastly politically incompetent before enga engaging with uh, others. As the emergentists uh, themselves acknowledge, some degree of political knowledge is uh, required of individuals if collective wisdom is to emerge. And moreover, uh, it is well known now that deliberation can ind indeed foster uh, polarization and confirmation bias when it involves individuals uh, strongly holding to their partial views and neither used nor willing uh, to bend them to the deliberative force of the, ber the better argument. Uh, in other words, <coughs> whether deliberation is adequate or properly conducted certainly depends on its proper institutional design, but also significantly on the cognitive and reasoning skills, uh, information and deliberative predispositions that citizens will individually bring uh, with them to the debate. For instance, uh, openness to changes in one's opinions that discussing with others might bring about arguably falls uh, within the political competence that we should expect from citizens before they engage uh, in deliberation, if it is to be fruitful. And the same goes for uh, 
the individual ability to critically select between true and false information or sound and unsound arguments in the deliberative process. So these uh, various skills and information should arguably be acquired before entering the political, uh, political deliberation through background systems of education and information. So to focus on the former, a standard, a standard liberal view on education stresses that it helps students become independent members of a society by providing them with sufficient knowledge of their environment and teaching them how to adapt to and act on this environment, uh, notably by making good use of their ability for judgment. And arguably, education can also, um, in part, be seen as contributing to making politically competent citizens, providing them with adequate social and political knowledge, uh, background knowledge, and teaching them how to understand and process new information critically. This is assuming, of course, that uh, curriculums are organized to provide students, uh, in order to provide students with proper tools and relevant facts about their social organization, and that uh, education is public, inclusive, and egalitarian, so that no body of citizens uh, is deprived of relevant political knowledge and a capacity for critical judgment. So insufficient integration in the school system and unequal access to higher education in effect risks uh, creating two bodies of citizens, <coughs> thus undermining epistemic democracy's premise of a politically competent uh, citizenry. Uh, so I then show that strong socioeconomic inequality might similarly jeopardize democracy's collective ability to track the common good. And this for two reasons. Uh, first, a deeply unequal distribution of goods, resources, and power within society might affect citizens' political competence. So here, uh, I uh, rely uh, too on Jason Stanley's recent work on flawed ideologies. I do not use the word propaganda. Uh, so Stanley argues uh, that flawed uh, ideologies are spreading because of pervasive inequalities uh, within society. Uh, so flawed ideological beliefs, for example, junk science, or the belief that immigrants are stealing our jobs, are sincerely held uh, false beliefs about social reality that prove extremely hard to revise by rational means. And so um, unequal social structures appear to give rise to flawed ideologies, according to Stanley, in two different ways. They result uh, from either rationalization, so privileged groups trying, are trying to justify their advantage and protect their interests uh, from potential contests. Uh, so either from uh, rationalization or ignorance and error. <coughs> so underprivileged groups uh, are inter internalizing narratives justifying their inferior social status or they are adhering to a simplistic let's say, enemy targeting uh, theories. So Stanley argues that flawed ideologies impede uh, democratic debates because they make those who hold them blind to social injustice and to the evidence that would normally alert them to their factual uh, error or faulty reasoning. And so, as a result, uh, democratic decisions perpetuate injustice instead of addressing it. So this is the first reason. The second reason is more straightforward. Uh, in a society pervaded by inequality, citizens will hold different perspectives on the public good, uh, depending on um, their socioeconomic position. People tend to have very different views on what is good for their society, for their country, depending on whether they are members of the top 1%, relative, uh, relatively well off or underprivileged. And so this fact uh, can be interpreted in two different ways. On one interpretation, when a society is deeply divided um, along economic lines, the very idea of a common good is put into question. So disadvantaged and privileged citizens' interests go in opposite directions, which make it impossible for any general interest to emerge. So. Um, this interpretation is in accord with a number of epistemic theories of democracy which require 
that the political community be united by some political ideals, social ends, and general interests, which citizens are indeed aware of. So a deeply divided society arguably fails to present this coherence uh, in ends and values, and hence cannot be expected to make collectively good decisions. But justice and the common good uh, may alternatively be interpreted as some kind of universal ideals uh, that any society should strive to realize, be it divided or not. Uh, okay, but even if we adopt this perspective, it is doubtful that citizens will be able to abstract themselves from their positions to reflect on what is objectively good for their community when that community is deeply divided uh, economically. Besides the cognitive obstacles, mentioned before, when social divisions are too deep, feelings of alienation and self-interest are likely to prevail uh, over public spiritedness. So even the desire for a just political organization presupposes a degree uh, of uh, social attachment and solidarity that citizens caught up in unjust relations and structures are unlikely to experience. In other words, citizens will not feel obligated towards the collective unless they sense that they are all treated as full members of a single community, enjoying equal standing with similar opportunities and general pro prospects um, in life. All right, so uh, I, I come to the third part of the paper. Once, once we accept, and I'll be very short because it's really the, the weakest part. Uh, <laughs> so once we accept that the epistemic virtues of <coughs> democracy are grounded uh, in certain background social conditions, however, uh, other questions soon arise. Uh, first, um, does demo <coughs> democratic legitimacy depend on the previous realization of extra democratic conditions? So do external conditions such as education or socioeconomic equality have to be met before any democratic decision uh, is can be said to be legitimate? And second, are uh, inclusive education and socioeconomic uh, equality substantive ideals defined prior to any democratic choice? So are there some significant aspect of social reality that slip from uh, democratic rule? So if, if so, if it was the case, we would have uh, rescued self-government from its external limitations by rights, only to concede that democratic decisions cannot be legitimate unless some other conditions are met. So uh, I, I don't have uh, definitive, I don't have answers uh, to these questions. So uh, let me just end this presentation uh, on some simple ideas on how the general problem uh, could be framed and what, in, what it implies, sorry, for an epistemic conception of democracy. One way to read, one embarrassing way to read our conclusions uh, would be to say that democracy is not a, uni well, I, I don't know about that part, but uh, uh, not, not a universally desirable ideal. Uh, it's, um, the, embar the embarrassment comes now, it's, it's, it's a familiar argument from modernization theory that poor and uneducated societies are generally unfit for democratic institutions. So uh, are there social prerequisites for the establishment <coughs> of democracy in that sense? Um, my answer at that point is unsatisfying, but I, 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 I just think it's important to distinguish two different questions here. First, can democracy claim to be epistemic um, when some specific cognitive and socioeconomic conditions are not met? And second, can a democracy become epistemic? So the paper suggests that the answer to the first question is negative. But this says nothing about how to answer the second question. A democracy can exist without meeting the conditions um, that would qualify it as epistemic. And though such a democracy would not be fully legitimate, at first, it is conceivable that it could, through time, equip itself with the appropriate um, means to reach better political decisions. It's indeed an ancient argument in favor of democracy that it might offer the surest arbor for the development of education and socioeconomic equality within society. Um, I'll, I'll end on this point. It's important, important to note the difference in that regard between these preconditions and the notion that rights uh, constrain democracy from the outside. Education and socioeconomic equality are not put forward as values that should be left out um, of ordinary democratic politics for fear of uh, popular error, passion, or interest. But uh, they are put forward as conditions which make 
good popular decisions possible and likely. So in that sense, they are, they are classed as uh, limiting constraints than as enabling circumstances. So rather than extra democratic conditions bearing on democratic legitimacy, these circumstances may thus be seen as internal features of a democratic society facilitated by the democratic regime and nurturing its epistemic uh, capacities in turn. I'll, I'll stop there. We'll now have a discussion by uh, Arashat Zaida for about 10 minutes. <coughs> so uh, there's, um, the paper suggests there's two criteria for evaluating political procedures and in institutions. Um, first is the procedures themselves. Uh, and sometimes the paper characterizes this as in terms of self-determination, political equality, that's the democracy side of things. And the second is outcomes. Uh, so the goodness or the justice of outcomes of the political procedures where goodness or the justice of outcomes is at least partly determined by substantive procedure independent criteria. And the problem is supposed to be that if both procedural and substantive considerations are normative, then in principle there can be a conflict between them. The right procedures may yield bad or unjust outcomes. And the solution, um, well, at least a model for how to solve the problem or a ideal of the solution of the problem um, according to Hussain, is precisely epistemic democracy, which she understands to be an ideal that attempts to bypass the in principle conflict by ensuring that, empirically speaking, the right procedures also produce the good and just outcomes. So the question then becomes under what institutional and socioeconomic conditions this could be the case, under what empirical conditions <coughs> epistemic democracy understood in this way is possible. And the argument of the paper is that basically, well, the, the, the paper pays attention to three kinds of requirements for this ideal to be realized. The first is something that is treated in the literature already. These are institutional requirements of good deliberation or aggregation. Um, but Roussin says that this is not enough, and so the focus is on the other two. Um, and as, as you heard in the presentation, the first is the equal distribution of political competencies. Institutional design is not enough because we need competent individuals, and therefore the education system must cultivate these competencies. Unequal education leads to incompetence and therefore undermines the possibility for epistemic democracy and hence the empirical reconciliation of the in-principle conflict that may exist between procedure and outcome norms. Uh, the, sec the second, or the third, but the second that is the focus of the paper is socioeconomic equality. Inequality leads to flawed ideologies. It leads to either there being no shared common good or there being intractable disagreements about what the common good is, and that undermines the determination of uh, the right or good outcomes through democratic decision-making procedures. So then there's a potential problem. The problem is that it looks like that all of these requirements of epistemic democracy are outcomes that Hussain would want procedures to produce. So the question is this, how can we get these outcomes, so there's three of them, but uh, of course the focus is on the, the latter two, good institutional design, an education system that equally distributes political competencies, and socioeconomic equality, when, by hypothesis, we don't yet have the relevant conditions of ep epistemic democracy in place. So how can we get there? And Hussain's answer, uh, which was much more tentative in the presentation, a little bit more affirmative in the paper, uh, is um, that it, the answer is again empirical. Uh, even if we don't yet have epistemic democracy in place, uh, democratic procedures will themselves produce these good outcomes. For example, if we have democratic procedures in place, even though we don't have epistemic democracy, we're going to get to a <coughs> position of socioeconomic equality. So here's a couple of objections to that uh, argument. First is an external criticism. It's not internal to the argument. Uh, and that's that there's no empirical evidence uh, for this. Um, and on the face of it, it's uh, dubious that democratic political institutions of that kind are sufficient to produce such an outcome. That was the fear, if by democracy we're talking about representative <coughs> democracy, that was in fact the fear of property owners throughout the 19th century, that if you have the enlargement of the franchise, that that's exactly what's going to happen. It didn't in the 20th century, and so that's one of the puzzles. Why did it happen? But the evidence seems to be that that's not what representative democracy does. It doesn't produce socioeconomic equality. Um, so, but that's, that's kind of an external empirical worry, but there's a problem actually internally to the argument about making that claim. And that is that um, it's in considerable tension with uh, Hussain's own premises. She has just argued uh, 
that we need equal distribution of political competencies and socioeconomic equality because without these, democracy won't produce good outcomes. And then now we have a contrary thesis saying that without these things, we're going to get the good outcomes about, say, socioeconomic equality or a good education system. So that seems to be in considerable tension internally with the argument that might be. So that's probably why I was much more hesitant, I think, in the, in the presentation. Um, there's a different answer that the paper focuses on, uh, but was not the focus of the presentation that I want to turn to, um, that is a target of criticism in the paper. And that is to say that, um, is what she calls in the paper liberal exclusivism, uh, that the potential conflict between procedure and outcome standards um, are uh, going to be dealt with via substantive norms that provide extrinsic constraints on political procedures such that those procedures can't produce certain kinds of outcomes. So we're talking about constitutional constraints on democratic majority decision-making, constitutional protection of rights specified proper, prior to, as she puts it, the popular will, or democratic commitments. And she has two objections against these, um, uh, this kind of an approach. The first is that she says that this begs the question of which rights or principles be constitutionally protected. And it seems to me that in reply to that first objection that um, I would, I would have thought that it doesn't really beg the question. It does raise the question, um, but uh, the question can be answered by a theory of justice or goodness of outcomes that incorporates procedure independent standards for evaluating those outcomes. So I don't see what question is being begged here if you just have a theory that says here's the, here's the right outcomes and uh, we're going to constrain democratic decisions in such a way that it produces them. Uh, also note, and this might be a little more controversial, is that I don't think that any theory, not even a purely procedural theory, can avoid providing subsubstantive procedure independent norms about political procedures. No theory can say that the only standards that are normative are whatever come out of democratic procedures because the theory must tell us what a democratic procedure is. In other words, it must specify independently of democratic procedures the normative standards that are constitutive of the democratic procedures themselves. Those standards aren't going to be the outcome of a democratic procedure because we first need to know what those standards are. Uh, so I think that Hussain's real objection uh, is the second one in the paper, and that is that um, the, that strategy relies on a purely substantive outcome-oriented standard, ignoring the normativity of intrinsically procedural standards. Um, so in other words, it's just an instrumental, it's a purely instrumental account. And um, so I don't think that that approach needs to do that. Uh, it could view certain substantive outcome standards as extrinsic constraints, but within those constraints recognize the normativity of procedural standards. Um, so I think the objection needs to be reformulated as saying that there's no procedure independent standards. In other words, that she would want to deny in, in, you know, in, in laying that objection uh, that there are no procedure independent standards. Um, other than those that constitute the procedure itself that could be normative. In other words, the objection really sounds like, uh, in order to really press that objection, you would have to take a purely proceduralist view um, of democracy. But given that Hussain begins by acknowledging the in independent normative significance of both procedure and outcome standards, I don't think that this is actually what she wants to do. So I think the objection requires a reformulation to see exactly what it is. And I would suggest uh, distinguishing between three things. Uh, the first is the constitutional protection of political rights that are deemed by the theory to be constitutive of the right or the democratic procedure itself. Um, second is the constitutional protection of outcomes that are the empirical or causal preconditions for the effective uh, um, democratic or correct procedure to operate. And those would be the kinds of things that we're talking about, socioeconomic equality and so on. And third, the constitutional protection of uh, rights or outcomes that are not related to the right pr political procedure. So certain kinds of, let's say, non-political expression, uh, the protection of ecological values that may not be empirical preconditions for democratic procedures or uh, constitutive of them in any way. So I think what needs to, for, for that objection really to be uh, formulated in a way that I could sink my teeth into, I think those three need to be clearly separated. Um, and so let me just end by saying that I think that the merit of the paper is identifying empirical preconditions uh, for promoting good outcomes given democratic procedures um, and the attention to the socioeconomic and educational requirements. I think the part that I'm more skeptical about is the, uh, the, the sort of gesture towards the possibility 
that we might be able to obviate the need or avoid the need to provide a normative theoretical answer about how to resolve conflicts between procedure and outcome norms. I just don't think you can get away with uh, avoiding that question. Bye. Mm -hmm. Thank you for about five minutes, uh, right. maybe two minutes. Wait. Thank you very much. Thank you for the reformation at the end. It's really, uh, it's actually really helpful, and I, I, um, I think you're right. I actually, I agree with a lot of what you said, and also the reconstruction of the argument is, uh, is interesting and enlightening because it's not. Yeah. Uh, all right. Um, so let me react to some of your remarks and maybe try and answer s some of your objections. I don't know. Uh, first, you said, OK, there are two criteria. Uh, the first one is procedura procedural. It's just a, um, I don't know, a remark on a terminology. But you said the first is procedural. And so here is the democratic part. It's self-determination, uh, democratic rule, participation, etc. Um, I actually agree with you uh, when you say that um, it's impossible to build something like a purely pure proceduralism in democratic theory. I don't think it works. So uh, it's uh, substantive claims are indeed unavoidable. And so this is why I wouldn't say that uh, the procedural requirement is the democratic uh, is our democratic requirements for poli for uh, democratic legitimacy. Uh, we didn't say that, yeah, because if you talk about participation, equi political equality or inclusi inclusiveness, uh, you're already talking about substantive uh, requirements and not purely procedural ones. Um, so that's just a, a clarif clarification on, on, the, on the terms. So about the two objections uh, raised against um, liberal exclusivism, so the view that uh, rights, constitutional rights and, and uh, principles are conceived as uh, liberal norms, let's say, that exist, that pre-exist democracy and that are here to make sure that democracy uh, un understood purely as a popular rule doesn't uh, ruin the day. Um, so by constraining it uh, from the outside, um, the first objection, you say, no, it doesn't beg the question, because if you predefine what the right outcomes are, and uh, you say, OK, um, I don't know. The, I guess the, it's a standard objection. It's the one uh, Waldron uh, makes, or uh, Bellamy, Bellamy makes. It's the idea that there is a disagreement, a democratic disagreement over rights. And so um, by uh, setting them before any democratic uh, uh, conversation has taken place is is kind of being the question. It's kind of uh, indeed uh, defining rights um, when these rights, uh, the content of these rights and constitutional principles are uh, controversial, are the object of a debate and disagreement. So, <sighs> all right. About the, um, yeah, I guess I'll I'll stop here because I I mean this gave me a lot to think about. So I'm I and why, but I, it's true. You're right. Uh, the f the third part of the paper. I'm really I don't know how to answer this question, and I'm not con I'm not happy with the with the the theories I. I don't endorse them. I talk about them, but it's obviously it doesn't really work empirically. It's not uh, uh, so even the external objection uh, uh, works, and so this is why indeed I was more uh, hesitant or prudent uh, in my oral presentation. But it seems to me I I think you're right. It's unavoidable. Unavoidable at one point you have to recognize that there are some substantive uh, requirements. Uh, prior to any democratic choice. And so, yeah. But thank you, thank you a lot. OK, so we have about 25 minutes for the Q&A. Uh, I'll take your names <coughs> in order. We can start with Kevin Elliott. Great, thanks. Um, so I, I really like this paper. Uh, it sounds like, um, the, so I just want to give a couple of hopefully constructive things. So first of all, um, it sounds like the exclusivist 
uh, this, this business about the liberal exclusivism, mm -hmm. uh, it sounds like that might uh, need its own paper. Mm -hmm. uh, it sounds like you really want to break these mm -hmm. things apart. The title is about the social preconditions of epistemic yeah. democracy, and that's the stuff that I found the most mm -hmm. uh, new and innovative and interesting. Yes. Um, so, so there's that. Uh, and then, so with respect to that stuff, um, I just want to suggest a couple of things. First of all, um, it, it, you know, while it's absolutely true that um, some minimal level of competence would be expected of ordinary citizens in order to uh, make an epistemic argument get off the ground, I don't think anybody would really uh, dispute that, it's you assume, you seem to be assuming without, without argument that the, the way to develop that Perhaps the only way to develop that competence is through formal education. And I think that's false. I think that's clearly false. Um, there's lots of ways uh, that people talk about uh, in the literature, uh, people learning things like on the job uh, and also defining what, what does it mean to be politically competent, right? If I'm a, if I'm a, a, a gun nut, um, you know, I might know an awful lot about like reasonable gun regulation. What would constitute a reasonable gun regulation? I might have weird preferences about that thing, but um, I might know something about it even if I don't have a high school education, right? Um, so it's it's not obvious that I need education in order to be competent, and you might want to think about that a little bit. Uh, one way of thinking about this is in terms of um, one of the ways that epi that democracy might perform well epistemically is by information pooling, not just by like complex you know processing of information. Um, and one other thing, and I think this is just, uh, I, I think um, in this argument, uh, you, I think you underappreciate the em what you call the emergentist view, uh, and, and maybe Helen will have more to say about this, but, um, you know, I think sort of, you say a few number, a few things which lead me to think you have an excessively sort of cognitive account of what citizens need to have in mind in order for democracy to perform well. You complain that citizens' um, knowledge might be partly experiential and that members of privileged groups might hold a one-sided view of politics. I mean, everybody's going to have a one-sided, sorry, I'll be faster. Uh, the, um, so one of the things that John Stuart Mill talks about in On Liberty is the idea that um, we might emerge a truth through, the con through conflict under hostile banners. That's part of the emergentist view, and I don't think you give that sufficient that's sorry. All right, thank you. Yeah, you're right. Uh, there are three papers in this paper. Uh, yeah, I know. I just realized uh, it when I was writing it, and I was late, and so I wanted to give you the paper on time. So yeah, but I agree. Uh, I agree. So um, yeah. So no, I wasn't clear. I'm not. I'm not really. I'm. I'm not saying there are two conditions and only two conditions for political competence and public spiritedness to exist. On, on the contrary, I'm really not saying that at all. I'm, um, I'm saying that education is indeed one condition. I don't even know if it's a necessary condition. I would tend to, s to think so, but I don't. I, you're right. Of course, uh, you can learn things uh, on the job. You can, and you can learn things by just uh, as a, you know, you can inform yourself. You can inform yourself. You can, uh, sure, they are. I guess um, the, the these two examples examples are just um, uh, a way for me to say that um, to stress the importance of broader social conditions for epistemic democracy. <coughs> it's just the idea that uh, institutional design is, uh, of course, um, important and um, and necessary, but maybe. It should be conceived uh, not to not just narrowly as uh, um, designing political institutions. Uh, so when I I take the education example to say okay, uh, or at least even just designing um, democratic proce procedures. So uh, education can be think can be thought of as a as a political political institution, but it's it's. Um, yeah, I guess uh, the main point is um, you 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 need to uh, to think of epistemic democracy within uh, a broader social uh, context, uh, broader so social circumstances. So um, you're right. It would it would I mean it would uh, imply thinking about systems of education, systems of information, and also. 
maybe what happens uh, in the workplace. It's, uh, yeah, it's broad. Uh, so about the emergencies view, yeah, maybe I'm, um, I'm not being very fair in the, in the paper um, because I guess lack of space made me yeah, uh, caricature the, the view a little bit. Uh, because of course, I, I try to say at least that yeah, pooling of information and the, even the non-consensual uh, uh, meaning of arguments and views and perspectives uh, is indeed very important. I, I, I recognize that, but just I think that you, for this to be fruitful, uh, you need to have uh, individuals that enter the debate, to enter the, this pooling of information process in a certain state of mind and with certain, uh, it's not, it's okay if it's one-sided, but um, I guess um, uh, to have the ability to accept that one's view can be changed. It's not, it's not something that uh, is, uh, it's not a spontaneous ability. This is, this is, I think this is something that you can learn before, that you should learn before uh, any deliberation takes place for it to to work. Um, yeah. Brianna McGinnis. Um, okay, so just a couple of quick points. Um, I agree. I think that you, there are a couple of different papers in here, and I think the one on um, background conditions is especially interesting. And to that um, point, I guess it just would raise the question as to why you necessarily um, characterize democracy or democratic government as being um, inclusive. Right, because you're talking about making decisions within a group, and I think for that reason it's inherently exclusive. I think especially if you're talking about um, like cultivating a DMOS that's well-educated, that's um, resources intensive, there is all the more incentive then to make it more exclusive. Um, and then a uh, lesser point is just on how you characterize constitutions. I think it's maybe really formal to look at them as being, um, you say you call them independent of and prior to the popular will. Um, but I think that's overly formal. Constitutions are constantly um, revised, either formally through um, amendment procedures or through interpretation. Small point, but I think it's an important one. Right. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Um, well, um, about the first, the first point, um, nece the necessarily uh, exclusive character of democracy. So you mean by that that it's since it's a state, it is exclusive. Is what you mean? It's a or group of people making decisions. It's a constrained group of people making decisions. Um, and I, I guess I, I object to sort of like just defining it as inclusive. Right? That democracy is somehow inherently inclusive. So it's not okay. It's not universally inclusive, but still, it's like it's a an easy way to distinguish it, to, dis to distinguish democracy from uh, an autocracy, for instance. Mm -hmm. Here it's clearly necessarily exclusive. A democracy, <coughs> yeah, sure, you cannot um, include uh, uh, the Chinese citizens in, uh, in uh, the decision, uh, in the, the decisions of the, the American government, but, or plans, but still, you have like, um, you have a citizenry that is, uh, defined in inclusive terms. And so uh, when you say it's resources, um, it's uh, it, it, it education, educating people uh, needs a lot of resources, that's what you're saying? Yeah, sure, but um, I guess here you, you can just uh, start from the fact that citizens in, uh, in our democracies today are citizens whether they have access to whether they have a higher education degree or not. So uh, you're not, the idea is not to restrict citizenry to the well educated. It's ex exactly the opposite. Is to say okay, um, it's yeah, it's the, the opposite of the uh, epistocratic move. I guess I don't know. It's uh, it doesn't seem to me that it's an argument against inclusiveness. But is it okay if we move on? No. To the next question, Andre, should I put it at the end of the list, or was it about specifically about this? No, no, no it's the end. Of the list. All right. So, next question is David Estes. Thanks. Yeah, it's an interesting paper. I want to focus on the part that you admit is less developed, the liberal exclusivist thing. And what I, my point is just a very small one, in, in the sense that I just want to put you two back in engagement on this because I think Arash anticipated something you said in reply to him, and I just want to press it a little bit. Yeah. 
Never mind whether it's question begging exactly, that's not so much your worry to have certain constitutional rights settled outside, but it's some kind of problem. And the question is, what kind of problem is it supposed to be? Um, and in response, you say, and here are very much following Waldron, well, there's disagreement about those things. Mm -hmm. But that's not like a fully worked out, like, what's the problem? Yes, there is disagreement about them. And Arash anticipated that you might seem to be committed to the view that anything there's disagreement about can't be settled except by democratic means. And then he said that's inconsistent because you've taken democratic means for granted. So, um, so one way you might push this is, well, if you can take some things for granted prior to democratic procedures, like democratic procedures themselves, why not some other things? But the other thing, and here's where I think is the place for you to, to work more to say, still, which things? Right? That doesn't settle that we can take these further things because Juliet could say back, well, now why not everything? Right? If we can't take these for granted prior to democratic procedure, why, why do we need democratic procedure at all? So anyway, there's a point in favor of each of you there. Yeah, thanks. It's uh, thanks for um, for uh, speaking for <laughs> for me because as you have noticed, it's hard for me to answer in English. Everything comes in mind in in French. So um, and and I don't know how to answer the questions I I raise in the in the third part of the paper because I agree with both sides. It's it's but I think you're right. You sh we should ask which things and how do you which things are supposed to be. Uh, define prior democratic choice and how do you justify that and I find it extremely hard to to come up with a justification I think that um, uh, Waldron is, is I mean has a, a point when he discusses rights even if uh, he, he should distinguish between constitutes constitutive phases of a democratic uh, discussion of rights and ordinary politics because it doesn't work uh, uh, if he doesn't do that but yeah I don't know thank you for your for your comment so just uh, sort of on the same topic first um, I was wondering why you're not in reply to Arash or, or David why you're not uh, making use of this argument you had towards the end of your dissertation uh, about the sort of uh, learned wisdom and the sort of um, uh, experimental dimension of democracy, yeah. which, which is the way through which democracies learn to put aside some things and never touch them again or, or make them safe from actual democratic procedures. So that might be a, a way to answer yeah. that, or that if, you, if you remain at this abstract sort of level of reflection where everything is a priori, it becomes really hard to have an answer, I think. And then the second question I, I wanted to, um, uh, uh, first, uh, first uh, I must say I completely understand the, the difficulty of, of you're, you're running into your paper because you're basically coming from political philosophy and trying to engage with this more empirical question of okay, what are now the social and economic conditions and, and, and so you don't have that many empirical references in your bibliography and so I think that's like you're navigating this intermediary uh, domain and it's, it's, it's I, I sympathize um, but I one thing I would uh, I think my, one thing that might help is come at the empirical literature with a very clear definition of what you mean by democracy as a set of political institutions. Because when you when you say, um, you know, it, it would seem to be the case that we need some kind of economic inequality as a background condition for good epistemic outcomes, then you look at the literature and say so you see Gillens and Page on how there's a huge discrepancy between what majorities want and what they get. And so one conclusion could be, well, that's because we don't have the socioeconomic background conditions for, for the system to work. But another, another conclusion could be, well, it's, it's, it's actually not democracy. And that's why you don't, um, you don't get the, the, the match between majority preferences and outcomes, regardless of the socioeconomic discrep discrepancy. And it could be the case that you, you have democracy that are perfectly democratic and yet very unequal. So, you know, and I, I think you have to have some uh, prior definition of what you mean by democracy that is very specific to be able to say, well, here the problem in the discrepancy is because of the, so the socioeconomic conditions are lacking or because the political system is actually not that democratic. And in the US, I would say my, my implicit sort of uh, uh, intuition would be that it's not democratic enough. You don't have you know, equal rights, you don't have, uh, you have all this gerrymandering going on, you have uh, 
you know, it's, it's really failing the political procedures, really. So you don't even have to go into the socioeconomic conditions mm -hmm. to, to, um, to be critical. So I, 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 before you move on to the socioeconomic conditions, I would like to know more about the political procedures you're committed to yourself. Yeah. Well, this is what uh, uh, Page and Associates say in their paper. They say that uh, if uh, all citizens were granted uh, equal political influence, that would uh, make major changes in the, in the, in the, the policy. But so it's, I mean, you already told me that, that I needed a, a clear definition of what democracy is before I, but I don't want to do that. <laughs> Uh, I don't want to start with the definition of democracy because I think that part of the inquiry is what is it. So I, I, I cannot start uh, well, like that. But um, I mean, the procedures. Um, what I at least what I try to what I try to suggest in the paper again is that democracy is not only a set of political institutions. Um, I think it's also, it also, so, or at least it relies on, it has to rely on a, something like a democratic society defined by some degree of equality between uh, the members, uh, whether it be cognitive or uh, economic equality, so social uh, equality. Um, but so if you, if you want, this, and so, you say, well, you can have a democracy, uh, it's perfectly democratic, but yeah, it's very unequal. Yes, but I would say it's not gonna um, su succeed yeah, in, in becoming epistemic, in being, it's, it's not gonna be an epistemic democracy. It's not gonna, if you have a deeply unequal society with people, like a body of citizens, uh, wholly politically incompetent, you're not gonna, have uh, good collective decisions. You're gonna, I mean, the starting point of the paper was, I, I wrote the abstract, I'm sorry to, uh, it's the new, I guess, uh, Nazi point, but uh, I, I, I had the idea of the abstract the day after Trump was elected. And I thought, all right, so yeah, how can you work on epistemic democracy and how can you face this result? And but it's not a democracy that So yeah, okay, so maybe with, uh, well, with yeah, sure, starting with a, uh, uh, campaign reform, like um, the the campaign finance reform and, and granting political influence to everyone, maybe, maybe. So we have um, at least three questions left and not a lot of time left. Uh, we have Frédéric Armstrong, André Poema, and Daniel Weinstock. So I propose that maybe we take the questions and then we let uh, Juliette uh, decide in which order she'd like to, to uh, enter that. Please try to keep sure. your questions uh, up. So there might be something that's dealt with in the paper, so I'm sorry because I didn't read it, but I'm uh, just wondering about the, 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 the question of education. So there seems to be no uh, principled uh, incompatibility between uh, epistemic democracy and a system of education that gives basic education for the population, but that still has a sort of uh, elitist uh, kind of training for political elites. So I'm just wondering what you would say on that. Uh, Maybe, we, uh, why? Okay. is it okay? And I? So very shortly, I guess it's more like a, a framing suggestion. Um, if you, what you really care about is the social part of the paper, uh, social conditions. I think it might be interesting to actually pick up on Jason Stanley's argument that so, uh, socioeconomic inequality uh, in some way creates an epistemic harm on both sides mm -hmm. uh, of the inequality, uh, insofar as it insulates both the socially disadvantaged and the socially super advantaged yeah. uh, from actually having accurate knowledge about. Uh, mm. And that could be a way of, of reframing it. So insofar as we care about epistemic democracy, then we care about social inequality. And that might, you know, you might spell out that in terms of education or in other respects. Then yeah. yeah. So I think that the, the paper would gain a lot from um, being a little bit more institutionally specific. Uh, in other words, you know, if we reduce uh, democracy to just deliberation, sort of ground up deliberation about the common good, then the competency threshold is going to be very high. If we have a view, you know, um, of, of institution of democracy as being based upon a set of institutions such that the competency is sort of distributed across a, a, a set of institutions. So to go back to the, to the exchange that David and I had this morning, you know, if it's a question of each citizen has to be able to build up a sort of policy platform from the ground up, then 
you know, it's, you're going to have a very high threshold. If, on the other hand, you have a kind of epistemic division of labor with a public set of institutions, uh, such that what is required of citizens is that they be able to assess, you know, proposals that are made by others, then your competency threshold might be a bit lower. So, in a, in a sense, the question is sort of undecidable unless we have a view of what you mean by uh, democracy. <laughs> Again, okay. Yeah. Um, I guess the, um, as far as political competence is concerned, I, I wasn't, I don't think that uh, having higher education is going to make you highly politically uh, competent as an expert on specific topics of policy or as a professional politician uh, would be or is. So it's not, uh, the idea is not to grant a very high uh, uh, threshold for uh, political competence is just to uh, make sure that instead of saying, oh yeah, uh, citizens are, the vast majority of citizens are uh, politically incompetent and well, let's see how we can um, have epistemic democracy uh, with this fact. I'm just trying to say, okay, maybe we could uh, uh, work on, the, on that threshold a little bit so they're not uh, vastly politically incompetent. Um, so, it's not incompatible with the idea of, epi of an epistemic division of labor. Um, but I guess one way of answering the first question and the, the, the your question is to say that um, implicitly in the paper it's true that it's, it's not a, I guess it's not a, a fully instrumental uh, argument. There is also the idea that uh, indeed if democracy is to be defined by something, uh, it has, uh, whether uh, on the social level or on the political level, it has to be that, uh, no, you cannot have like two bodies of citizens, uh, uh, a small minority, uh, extremely politically competent and very politically active, and the other one that is just kind of uh, apathetic, ignorant, and governed by the rest. So, and it's true that it's, uh, you could have an epistemic argument saying, well, you know, you can deal with um, n uh, like a vast majority of a citizen being competent, but I guess that there, there are some in intrinsic uh, or at least non-instrumental non uh, uh, arguments in my paper that I, I, I do not explicit that uh, are against that. Um, so this is why the, yeah. Last question. Mm. Yeah. Uh, that, that would be an external remark, maybe. Uh, you're speaking about the social conditions for reaching epistemic democracy, but um, I would say that, practically speaking, most of the time, the progress towards social equality, um, I would say, does not require nor pass uh, by public civilized epistemic deliberation at all. Yeah. Uh, most of all, it passed by social movements, strikes, an absolutely non-dialogical political conflict. So if you would need to have social conditions in order to reach epistemic democracy, epistemic democracy most of the time is uh, the worst way to reach these social conditions. So mm -hmm. are yeah. you dealing with that? Well, I guess it's uh, yeah, a new objection to this uh to this frail third part, yes, mm, it's not, maybe you don't, uh, indeed, they are pr these are social preconditions that are not reached, uh, well reached by a democracy, or by a um, democracy understood politically, like by a, a democratic uh, decision-making process, but by, indeed, struggles, social struggles and stuff. So, so um, I don't, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, thank you very much, Juliette.